Thank you for joining our Debbie Dream Foundation webinar series. Today's webinar is on molecular biomarkers with Dr. Samuel Sutner. I'm Jackie Bellow, Programs Manager for Debbie Dream Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to thank our sponsors, Mark, Estelle, and Brister Myers Squibb, for making our webinar series possible this year. First, I will share information about stomach cancer and Debbie Dream Foundation. Then we will hear a presentation on molecular biomarkers with Dr. Samuel Sumner. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A discussion. You can type your questions throughout the presentation into the chat section that appears on the webinar menu. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation as time allows. In addition, the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in the lecture library. In 2018, it was estimated that more than 26,000 Americans would be diagnosed with stomach cancer and more than 11,000 would die. Most patients are diagnosed at stage 4, where the 5-year survival rate is only 5%, and the incident rates in younger population continue to increase. Yet, many know very little about this disease, and little research is being done. Pictured here is Debbie Zellman, the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed with stage 4 stomach cancer in April 2008. She had no risk factors for stomach cancer and her symptoms were very vague. At the time, she was told her chance of being alive in 5 years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many reoccurrences over 9.5 years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23, 2017 at the age of 50. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and providing resources and education. Debbie founded DBF in April 2009. As an organization, we are a member of Civil Advocacy Coalition. Debbie served for many years as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces. As an organization, DBF will continue her important work and legacy. Debbie Stream Foundation is dedicated to advancing funding for stomach cancer research, raising awareness, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at debbiesdream.org. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 34 chapters across the U.S., Canada, and Germany and events are ongoing around the country. Our patient resource education program helps patients, their families, and caregivers match the survivor and caregiver mentors using disease-specific criteria, including stage, biomarker, and location. We host educational webinars and symposia year-round, and our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages. We have also provided $1 million in research grants to, to date and advocate each year during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. This past Advocacy Day was a huge success. We hosted 115 advocates, making this year our largest turnout yet, and our advocates had 230 meetings on the Hill. Due to the efforts of the Foundation, our partners, and our dedicated advocates, we help secure continued funding for stomach cancer research. The peer-reviewed can cancer research program received funding from Congress in the amount of $110 million, a $20 million increase from last year. Please consider joining us next year in February of 2021 in D.C. More information can be found on our website near the heading Take Action. This is a current snapshot of our website homepage with links to numerous resources. Here you can see some of our upcoming events. For more information about these and other events, please go to our website and click Events. DES is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on the slide are important phone numbers and email addresses you can use to contact our office and staff. 
We will now begin the presentation on molecular biomarkers with Dr. Samuel Sumner. Dr. Sumner is a gastrointestinal medical oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. He's also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. His clinical and research focus on gastroesophageal cancer. He works in a multidisciplinary team to optimize and individualize treatment using molecular characterizations across all stages of stomach cancers. Dr. Klempner conducts clinical trials and translational research with new targeted agents and immune therapy. He is active in the stomach cancer community, including local outreach, education, and advocacy. We'd like to thank Dr. Klempner for taking time out of the schedule today. Now, Dr. Klempner, we will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Pleasure to be doing another webinar for Debbie's Dream, and hope you're all staying safe and washing hands and practicing social distancing at home for this webinar. I advance the slide. Ah, there we go. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, also, I should disclose I'm a medical advisory board member for Debbie's Dream, uh, but the content of this lecture is, is entirely my own. So. My first version of these slides was very technical and, and full of papers and complicated science. Uh, I showed them to my wife, who's a former second grade school teacher, and she ripped them apart. Uh, so I redid this and tried to make it more relatable and boil it down to a few key points that I think are relevant. Uh, I'm actually thinking that all these types of lectures should probably be reviewed by her going forward. Uh, so we, we have a lot to cover, but the message is really that you need to educate yourself about your tumor because sometimes patients and caregivers are really the best advocates, especially in situations where oncologists may be less familiar with stomach cancer compared to other more common cancers. Uh, so we'll discuss some testing concepts, uh, the bare minimum that I think it's important to know, and, and finally I'll finish with some emerging targets. I should note that there are some targets beyond the scope of this talk. I've chosen to focus on the ones that have the largest amount of evidence uh, as they're the most likely to be relevant to your care. Okay, uh, to understand the details of something as complex as cancer, you really need to have a basic framework to build on. So. DNA is an alphabet of, of four letters that's organized in enough different ways to encode about 24,000 different genes. So normally each gene encodes these words um, and they get converted uh, to proteins that are like effectors. This is like uh, sensors or switches in a circuit. And proteins are the way that cells communicate with each other to generate signals such as growth, division, movement, or invasion. The problem is that when letters get disorganized in the DNA, it can change the whole sentence. And if that happens in the right place, then you can see that this pathways can be altered and the whole message can change. Uh, for me, this is kind of like autocorrect in text messaging. Usually it doesn't change the message, but if you just change one thing, one little word, you can actually change the whole message of the, of the conversation. And I think this example sort of highlights that. So ever since caregivers have been taking care of patients, they've observed differences between patients. So here we have two patients who are similar clinically, age, sex, baseline health, for example, and have tumors that look very similar under the microscope, as shown by these two pictures here. Uh, however, they respond quite differently to the same therapy, with this patient having a tumor decrease and this patient having a tumor increase. So why does that happen? Well, if you think about the last slide, you can start to think about how many different ways you can misspell a word and how each patient's tumors can have different words that are misspelled. So everybody's tumor is really different. Uh, and these tumor changes happen in the DNA and the protein level. And a gain, uh, a gain in one word can change the whole message. And so in this person, all the words are pretty uniform. And in this person, there is multiple different mutations. And that's why this patient has a response and this patient doesn't. So you can understand that if you want to understand why some people may respond differently than others, it's important to go to the source of the information, and that's the DNA. So that's really where we're going to start in this lecture. So 
sorry, I'm just getting used to this advanced thing. So um, just to back up for a second, although we did have some understanding of stomach cancer before 2014, it was still really a black box. Uh, since that time, uh, our technologies have really greatly uh, increased our understanding of stomach cancer at the molecular level, including DNA. So we have really come to appreciate a very high degree of differences, often called heterogeneity, between patients and also in the tumor of a single patient. However, from looking at enough patients at the DNA level, we can start to look for patterns and we can make some broad classifications called subtypes. And some of you may have seen microsatellite instability as a subtype or something called genomically stable, which we'll get into a little bit more. It's really important to note that actually this type of research is entirely built on the generosity of patients uh, who are donating samples. These might be surgical samples, these might be biopsy samples. And um, at the end, I'll talk about a project called the Count Me In Project, which is designed to really continue to build upon this so we have an even better, like a higher resolution version of stomach cancer. I'm not going to get into whether you think this painting uh, could have been done by a second grader uh, or reflects the epitome of abstract art. That's a conversation for another time. So many of you have probably heard about testing, and I know we're spending a lot of time discussing background, uh, but honestly, gaining a basic understanding of these concepts is, is really critical so you can ask questions during your visits and, and during the cancer journey of yourself or your care or your uh, loved ones. So to add the next layer on top of the background we've been talking about, we can think about the different types of testing we use in stomach cancer. Tissue biopsies are still central and confirm the type of cancer and provide material for additional testing. So that is the top there that says tissue-based testing. But as you can see in the cartoon, tissue testing has some potential limitations. So what this black line here is supposed to be showing is that this is where a needle would pass through a tumor to gain a biopsy, and these would be the cells that would come out in the biopsy needle. And what you can see is that, yes, you're capturing these two slightly different tumor cells, but you're missing a population of other cells, uh, so you don't get a perfect picture of the whole tumor makeup. So to complement tissue testing, we continue to find increasing roles for blood-based testing, and that's often referred to as liquid biopsy, which I show here. At this point, it's hard to test proteins from the blood, but sampling the blood has the advantage of reflecting pieces of tumor, tumor uh, DNA shed from all areas of disease. So it might be a more global picture of the sentence changes in the tumor. So DNA from each one of these different tumor cells gets into the blood, and so you can take these little pieces of blood, uh, of little DNA pieces that are found in the blood, and you can sequence them to look for mutations and that may reflect pieces that are coming from the stomach or a lymph node or a liver or lung, depending on the location of the tumor. Uh, the text here is just for reference and has some additional details and a few points. Uh, mainly when you say, when someone says panel size, they're referring to the number of genes that the test is looking at. The liquid is generally smaller than, than tissue, as you can see. We can think of genes as like those are the potential targets. Uh, down at the bottom here is germline testing, and this is, this is outside the scope of this talk, but it's increasingly important to know that, that blood testing can also be used to look at normal DNA from normal cells to find things that may have been inherited in your family or influence cancer risk. Uh, so this is a topic for another lecture, but increasingly important. Just to cover this circulating tumor DNA or blood biopsy a little bit deeper, because I think probably a lot of you are uh, aware of this. So there's a lot of stuff floating around in our blood, um, including pieces of DNA from normal cells, and this is called cell-free DNA. That's up there on the left. In patients with cancer, you still have many more normal cells than cancer cells, so the DNA from the cancers that has the mutations make up only a very small fraction of the over, um, overall amount of DNA floating around in the blood. So that's why we see circulating tumor DNA is a component of cell-free DNA that comes from the tumor. And there's other factors that contribute to this too. 
In the future, I think there'll be further additional roles for this, including early detection of cancers and detecting patients at increased risk of their cancer coming back after surgery. Uh, I think simply you can think of tumor DNA as the rare fish in a sea of normal DNA. And, and this picture here is from a recent fishing trip with my brother. Uh, I'm the one on the right with the 60-pound wahoo to remind you that most of what floats around in the blood is normal DNA and cancer DNA is only a little fraction, like my brother's little fish. So, it's a simple question, but I think it helps to remind us, like, you wouldn't buy a house without an inspection, and, you know, there's that old expression, you know, you wouldn't buy a car without kicking the tires. You know, so I would ask yourself, you know, why, why don't people approach their cancers the same way? I mean, you should have it inspected and, and kick the tires and see what kind of alterations are, are in your tumor. This is true for all cancers, but when you get diagnosed with a new stomach cancer, my opinion is that you should at least do this at the minimum. So here we have the three standard biomarkers which should be tested in all patients with advanced disease. So this is considered standard of care. Uh, and I've listed some additional details mainly for reference. Uh, so this is what I would consider the bare minimum. Um, I wish I could put this on a card and just patients could get the card and they would understand what the testing of their tumor is, um, but you should ask this question of all providers. Um, should note that uh, it's embarrassing both for us as providers uh, and also um, as a general stomach cancer research community that uh, we have largely failed to educate patients on the importance of this. Um, and many patients are not even tested for these standard biomarkers. So HER2, PDL1, and microsatellite or mismatch repair, that's what MMR is, uh, should be tested from all patients with advanced disease. So these are some fundamental questions which I think, uh, if I could see you, I would ask you to raise your hands uh, if you already knew your tumor bi biomarkers and. Unfortunately, my bet is that many of you, uh, including maybe a few patients of my own who may be on the call, uh, may not know this information. Um, and sadly, a large portion of stomach cancer patients don't get adequate testing, as I mentioned. So really, if you take nothing else away from this lecture, please remember to talk to your care team about biomarker testing. This should really be standard for all patients with advanced disease. If it's not happening, Keep asking until you get an answer or reach out to Debbie's Dream or other advocacy organizations for help. Um, and I'll put Debbie's Dream CEO cell phone at the end of this on the last slide so you can call directly. Okay, so we discussed some of the tools that we have to help understand how each patient is to, how each patient's tumor is different and the essential biomarkers to understand about your tumor. So in the remaining time, I'm going to try to give you a high-level overview of translating this understanding into benefit. This, this picture was supposed to be saying that our targeted therapy bullets are still not as good as they need to be, uh, and I, I promise you this is not actually how they're developed, uh, although it does remind me a lot of paintballing as a kid. So HER2 is one of the standard biomarkers I mentioned, um, and understanding um, how this affects patients is really the basis for the other biomarkers. So about 12 to 20% of patients will have an extra repeated word in the DNA sentence in their tumor cell, and this is called a copy number amplification, and generally associated with too many copies of a gene, which makes too much protein, and so the protein gets put on the surface, and there's more than normal. So this is a normal protein in a non-cancer cell, and in a patient who has a HER2 amplification, meaning too many words leading to too much protein, they get too much protein like this. Too much protein means the cells, basically this is a switch that's always on. It sends a signal down to the brain, the nucleus, which tells the tumor cells to grow when they shouldn't be growing. So you can think that if you could target this protein that there has too much of it, uh, you might translate uh, to patient responses and improvement. So that is exactly what was true. Uh, on the right side, I'm showing you the trial comparing chemotherapy alone, which is the blue line to chemotherapy plus Herceptin or Trastuzumab, an antibody that binds and blocks this HER2 protein. And you can see that patients who got the antibody on average lived an additional uh, basically two and a half months 
compared to patients who did not get the antibody. Also, they were more likely to have tumor shrinkage, so 35% with chemo alone, up to nearly 50% with the addition of, of the uh, target-based uh, uh, treatment. Obviously, this is clearly not enough. A two and a half month survival is improvement, but uh, still we want much more. But really the message is that when we understand something about a tumor and we have a drug to address it, we tend to observe higher response rate and increases in benefit. And this will be a theme throughout their other biomarkers as well. So what we call microsatellite instability or MSI up here, also called mismatch repair, um, results from basically errors in the spell check mechanism. So in a normal cell, DNA copies itself perfectly and has a backup spell check function to cut out when there's an error, puts the wrong letter in, and then it replaces it with the correct letter. It's actually a really an amazing process. In most stomach cancer cells, this function is largely intact. So if you measure an area of DNA, there are relatively few mutations, as you see up here. This is an MSI low, so there's a mutation here, and then there's nothing with these words or letters, and then there's another mutation. However, if tumors where the mismatch repair system is defective, they accumulate numerous mutations throughout the DNA, so they have all kinds of errors. One of the things that happens when the tumor cells have a lot of errors like this is that the spelling errors get translated into the wrong word or protein. So the protein is different than the normal protein. And what this leads to is that the cells look abnormal on the surface. They look more and more different from a normal cell to the immune system. So this is really part of the reason, a large part of the reason, that immune checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab and nivolumab have high efficacy rates in MSI cancers or microsatellite high because these tumors look very abnormal to the immune system. So all they need is a little bit of nudge from the immunotherapy and then your immune system takes over. Again, this is something you wouldn't know about your tumor from looking under the microscope. It requires testing, providing another example of a biomarker linked to activity and access to the drug. So microsatellite high patients have access to immunotherapy in stomach cancer and in other tumor types. Just to drive this point home, uh, this is one of the very few technical slides in the presentation. So this is data from uh, two large phase three trials comparing immune therapy against chemotherapy. Um, the curves outlined uh, in blue, so the blue boxes, is the overall population and you can see that overall these trials were negative. Immunotherapy was not better than chemotherapy. So um, the peel line is the immune therapy and the purple line is the chemotherapy. However, what's really important is if you look at the patients with the MSI high tumors, the ones that you might think would respond better to immunotherapy, you see that these curves now flip-flop. Now they do fantastic with the immunotherapy patients doing much better. So this is a percent of patients alive, survival, and this is time. So if you look at the percent of people who are alive with stage four disease at two years, it's about 60% almost compared to chemotherapy, which is extremely low. The same thing is shown in another phase three trial here where the overall study was negative. But when you look at those MSI high patients and Yes, it's relatively uncommon, but those patients do exceptionally well. Here, I'm just showing it in table form, where you can see their response rate to immunotherapy is about 50%, whereas the response rate to chemotherapy in this population was only 17%. And here again, we see higher responses with immunotherapy. The point is that immunotherapy is not for everybody, um, but when we have markers, that are related to the biology and we can understand, uh, we can pick a better therapy. And in these patients, you can make the argument that they should never get chemotherapy. They could just get immunotherapy right from the time of diagnosis. This is the final test to talk about microsatellite instability. And this is an argument to test patients even with stage two and stage three stomach cancers. And so, this is evidence uh, from three clinical trials that are all 
pooled together to look at microsatellite instability in earlier stage stomach cancers, and the differences are striking. The percent of patients alive without disease five years from treatment is 72% for microsatellite high versus 52% for microsatellite low. So this is a marker that's called prognostic. People who have this deficiency in their tumor cells, which is about 8 to 20% of people, they actually do better anyway. Um, and then over here on the right side, what we're looking at is these are people with stage 2 and stage 3 cancers who got um, chemotherapy or just surgery. And what you see is that chemotherapy did not help the lower curve. It did not help the patients who had microsatellite high tumors. In fact, it may have actually harmed them. So we're starting to use the biology to inform our clinical practice where if we see at our institution a patient with stage 2 or stage 3 gastric cancer, and this is true of other institutions as well, we are now testing these patients for microsatellite instability because you can make an argument to go right to surgery without any chemotherapy. So I think the take-home message is that for newly diagnosed patients who don't have stage 4 disease, they should ask their doctors or surgeons or uh, anyone on their care team and say, you know, what is my MSI status? I think this needs to be a conversation within your treatment team because, in my opinion, the data is very compelling to avoid surgery in many of those patients. And we have actually uh, taken this and started practicing this way at our own institution. So. I'm not going to talk too much about PDL1 testing because I think there's um, it's a very large topic. But very briefly, uh, we have ways to turn down the immune response after an infection, for example. So when you get a bacterial infection, you need your immune system to rev up or a viral infection to help clear that infection. But equally importantly, you need a mechanism to turn your immune system back down. Otherwise, you'd live with an immune system revved up and you'd feel crappy and you might attack your own organs all the time. And so this is the one of the mechanisms that turns down the immune system. And, and T cells are the part of the immune system that are responsible for killing um, tumors. And so the tumor cell can put on its surface a PD-L1 protein. And even when the T cell comes in and says, hey, I know this is a tumor cell and I should kill it because it sees that it's abnormal. It's getting a second signal from the tumor cell telling it not to do anything. And so it doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there and the tumor cell is allowed to continue to grow. Drugs like pembrolizumab, which is called Keytruda, or nivolumab called Opdivo, or several other uh, antibodies, they block this interaction. So they block either over here or over here. And now the immune cell, it's sees the tumor, but it's not getting the negative signal, so it can go kill the tumor, these poorly drawn little breaking apart. Uh, and so this is often um, compared to cutting the breaks um, on the immune system. Um, this strategy has transformed cancer, particularly in lung cancer and melanoma uh, and kidney cancers, but in stomach cancer, we do test for this protein in all advanced patients who are candidates for therapy. Uh, briefly, this, this test is done from a biopsy sample because it requires a protein. And here, what I'm showing is different levels of the protein. So more than one is considered positive. And about 50 to 70% of patients um, are positive. And importantly, the level of positivity, so if you're greater than one or greater than 10 or higher, um, those patients have an even greater degree of benefit. So again, you should know if you are PDL1 positive or negative, but also ask about the actual number. Was I a 1, a 5, a 10, a 20? Because that actually does um, have emerging treatment implications. So, in uh, the final part, the last 15 or 20 minutes or so, uh, we're going to talk about emerging targets. And these are things that are not currently standard but for things that we do have drugs that are in later stage of development for stomach cancer. So again, this is by no means a comprehensive list, and there are many immunotherapy combinations that are beyond the scope of this talk. I've chosen to focus on agents that are in phase two or phase three trials, 
as these are in the clinic and these trials may be more widely available to you or uh, anyone you know. So here are the targets that I'm going to cover. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone that works with PowerPoint, but my computer suggested this uh, design, and I don't know how I feel about it, but it did remind me of that laser background that I wanted for my school picture in fifth grade, but my parents didn't want to spring the extra money for. So uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this type of background, but I'm sure there's a few of you out there who do. So this is not the coronavirus. Uh, although some of the news outlets, as far as I can tell, are just using random virus cartoons like this. Uh, this is uh, a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, and it's actually present in the majority of humans at some point and runs a self-limited course with no long-term effects. Uh, this is actually the virus that causes mono, uh, used to be called kissing disease. Uh, rarely, the consequences of viral infection can increase the risk of certain cancers, including stomach cancers. So EBV-associated stomach cancers is one of those cancers that can be linked to this virus in some patients. Uh, this is more common in Asian countries, although we're still learning the exact prevalence and relation to clinical features um, in Western populations. What is known uh, is that in advanced stomach cancer patients, EBV-associated cancers have very high rates of some specific mutations, one called PI3 kinase, and also tend to be particularly sensitive to some of our immune therapies. Um, here, uh, what we see is that this is each of these bars is one person, and tumor reduction going up means the tumor grew, tumor reduction going down means the tumor shrank, and this is the percentage of shrinkage. These are all stage four patients. And so what you see is that EBV is the blue, and you can see that all in this trial, all of the EBV cancers had excellent responses to immune therapy. And this is the subject of multiple ongoing research studies. Again, this testing is not standard, but it is widely available uh, in most hospitals and relatively straightforward from a biopsy sample. We're still refining who are the best patients to test. But this is something that should be considered in stage four patients because the association of benefit. So we are trying to routinely do this as are many other institutions. Some other places are taking a more targeted approach. Again, the point is that when you understand something about what makes the tumor tick, in this case, a virus associated cancer, you can also understand what, what its weakness might be in this case, sensitivity to immune therapy. The more you know about the tumor, uh, the better chance you have of finding something that has uh, a better chance of working. This is the next target I said we would talk about called um, EGFR. And so this is another receptor like HER2. It lives on the surface of normal cells, just like this. This is the outside rim of a cell, and then here's the receptor. And this is the outside of the cell over here, and this is the inside of the cell. Uh, same, just like HER2, you can get an error in the word, and you get repeated words, and you get too many copies of the gene, which is the same as having too much growth signal when it shouldn't. Same idea to Herceptin or Trastuzumab, and we do have drugs approved in colon cancer that target this receptor and have shown strong signals in selected patients. So here I'm just showing you that this is EGFR. When there's too much of it, you get this signaling, like turning on the switch. These are switch circuits, basically, inside the cell to tell this cell to grow. And these are things that you don't want, spreading to other places, growing, harder to kill, growing new blood vessels. This is what it looks like under a microscope. This is a normal. And then when there's too many copies, you see too much of this signal in the cell. You can also test this by DNA sequencing, uh, which is the more commonly uh, approached method. And here what I'm showing you is the same bars, and these are called waterfall plots. And here, again, this is only a small group of seven patients. But in this group of patients, and these are the treatments that they got, you can see everybody responded. Nobody's tumor was going this way, growing. Everyone's tumor was going down and shrinking. There's also some really interesting evidence that this response might be related to the level of amplification. So basically the more pink here, um, 
to better the chance of response. There's also um, some uh, evidence to suggest that if you have other things like a HER2 amplification and an EGFR amplification, you might be less likely to respond. Uh, the bottom line here is that this is not something you would ever know from standard testing, and so uh, we, like many centers, conduct um, extended biomarker testing or DNA sequencing, which is capable of uncovering um, these targets that I'm discussing. So I, I don't think this is considered standard, but I do think that asking about EGFR is something that is war warrants a discussion with your care team. And so this is roughly about 5% of all advanced stomach and lower esophagus patients, which is about as common as the standard biomarker microsatellite instability, which I mentioned earlier can also be found from uh, blood-based uh, DNA sequencing on many commercial tests as well. Um, this is a really interesting biomarker and it's important for several reasons. So in a perfect world, you'd have biomarkers that would cover a large portion of stomach cancer patients. So most of what we've been talking about are, are relatively small slices of the pie, 5% here, 5% there, 10% there. Uh, that's great for those people, but it doesn't help the other 70, 80% of people who don't have those markers. Uh, so this is a protein called um, CLODIN, which is abbreviated CLDN18.2. And this exists uh, in about a third of cancer patients have too much of this protein. Uh, the protein really is, is really only expressed in tumors and not very much in normal cells, except for a few cells lining the stomach. Uh, so that potentially makes it a good target because it's only in the tumor cells and not really in the normal cells. Uh, the company developed an antibody here, which binds to this protein, which is shown here. And when it binds to the protein, it shuts down the signaling, and it also brings in some other buddies. These are parts of the immune system that help to kill the tumor cell. And so this drug is called um, zolbituximab now that has a name, and we believe, like I said, it works by recruiting the immune cells after binding to the target protein, Claudin 18.2. There's already been some smaller trials showing very encouraging efficacy in combination with chemotherapy. So this is a, this is a protein test. Um, it's, in theory, very, relatively simple to implement. So here is the protein staining, we call them brown stains. This is the protein staining brown on the uh, cells, and this is just a regular picture under the microscope what the pathologist would normally see. So they can't tell just by looking here if the protein is going to be positive. They have to do the stain. The only way, unfortunately, at this time to um, get access to this uh, biomarker is to participate in one of the ongoing clinical trials. So, like I said, there was uh, a phase two trial that was very encouraging. So there is now a very large international phase three trial testing the addition of Volfox, which is a standard chemotherapy in patients with newly diagnosed advanced disease. They're testing the addition of this antibody zolpituximab to Volfox. Uh, I would imagine that many of you may live uh, in somewhat near proximity to a site because this is open at many locations throughout the country. Uh, the main point here is that this is another biomarker. It exists in about 30% of all stomach cancer patients at a higher level. And so for newly diagnosed patients, I would encourage you to think about asking your care team um, whether or not uh, you should be considered for this study or whether or not you should be referred uh, to somewhere that can conduct this biomarker testing and is participating in the trial. Uh, the trial is called Spotlight. As I mentioned there, it's also listed on clinicaltrials.gov, like all clinical trials, uh, and may have some additional information on the Debbie Stream uh, website as well. Uh, we, we, like many other institutions, uh, have this study open. So I showed you that HER2 testing is a critical component of biomarker testing at the time of diagnosis in advanced stomach cancer patients. You really need to know your HER2 status and that Herceptin or Trastuzumab is approved based on that survival benefit of about two and a half months for the average patient. So both of those agents, uh, so th that trial is, is good, it's an improvement, but it's not good enough. So both of the drugs that I'm showing here, this called DS8201, and this drug called margituximab are designed to 
build upon Herceptin or trastuzumab to, to make a, either a better version or work in a slightly different way. So what this drug does here is that it binds to HER2, and what it brings into it is it sneaks in basically a chemotherapy drug with it. So it, the cell binds HER2, and it brings in the drug unknowingly, and then inside the cell, the chemotherapy gets released and kills the cell. And so this is called an antibody drug conjugate, um, and it's a very smart and, and interesting way. And this drug has shown um, activity with response rates of about 40%, some quite durable in patients that had failed trastuzumab. So this is the actual data from one of the trials um, showing a response rate of about 43% uh, in people who had already failed um, chemo and uh, trastuzumab. The second drug down here just tweaks the antibody in a little bit different way that's better about linking to the immune cells um, to bring them in and do some additional killing. And this drug has also shown benefit, especially in people who have both the PDL1 protein and the HER2 protein. And here the response rate's a little better than 50%. So both of these drugs uh, are moving forward. Uh, this drug is open in a very large phase three clinical trial around the country called the Mahogany trial. Um, and this drug is actually a, was just recently approved for breast cancer with HER2, uh, and in Japan is being approved for stomach cancer with HER2, and we actually anticipate um, it will come to the U.S. Uh, as the data continues to emerge. The real point here is that it's great if your team looked for um, HER2 in the beginning, as they should. Uh, a couple important points is that if Herceptin or Trastuzumab stops working and there's an area of tumor growing, we're often very interested to try to understand why that's happening. And one of the ways we understand that is to check a blood at the time of tumor growth or to do a biopsy if possible. And then we reevaluate and try to understand how the tumor became resistant to Trastuzumab or Herceptin and whether or not one of these two drugs may be a good idea. So really, we should always be thinking one or two steps ahead. So from the time you start on your first chemotherapy, we're always trying to plan you know, a couple scenarios ahead. What if this, what if that? Um, and I think that that's important when you're thinking about some of these drugs which may have activity. So again, uh, another thing to discuss with your team. It's kind of like uh, if you remodeled your house You'd want to inspect it again, make sure everything was good and you had all the right permits. So this is the same idea when, you know, when we do something to a tumor, like treat it with chemotherapy or with Herceptin, and then it responds and then part of it grows, the tumor has undergone some degree of remodeling. And so we want to sort of check it out again and kick the tires. So that's why we try to repeat blood and, and repeat a biopsy whenever it's safe and, and possible. So if you add this all together, um, we don't have time to cover every biomarker, and we're continuously looking for new weaknesses in stomach cancers that we can try to exploit clinically. But really, the, the fastest way to do this uh, is to increase awareness and, and, in my opinion, uh, empowering and educating the patients, but also to increase research participation. So any of you watching are already way ahead of the curve, and I would challenge you to do you know one thing different after watching this symposium. Maybe it's participate in research. Maybe it will just be to tell someone in your community or someone else affected um, something you learned. Uh, you might help yourself, but you also might help the next person down the line. And so this is really what we covered. So take home messages, you need to know your tumor. You know, your oncologist should know your tumor, but you should know it as well. Asking about the standard biomarkers, which are microsatellite instability, HER2, and PDL1, that's considered standard of care. So if you don't have that data available, you need to understand why. Uh, and then the additional biomarkers, which I think are perhaps the most immediately relevant, are EGFR, EBV, that's the virus, Claudin 18.2, that's the protein linked to the antibody drug. FGFR2 is an interesting one we didn't talk about. This is my favorite slice of the pie on here. And then I mentioned at the end, repeat biomarkering should be a discussion. Anytime there's a key treatment decision, it's 
just like you would do before you made any big decision in life. You would kind of map it out, think about it, just like we, when before we make a big decision about changing a treatment, we want to try to understand as much as we can uh, about both the tumor uh, and the patient um, and the therapy. So where can you go to learn more? Um, obviously, you can watch this webinar as many times as you want. Um, but really, your care team should be a primary source. Uh, excellent organizations like Debbie's Dream and others uh, that host events like this and have educational uh, uh, lectures available. Um, the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, has an excellent patient guide available in multiple languages that gives guidance on questions to ask your team. Uh, Count Me In Project, and I want to highlight this one for a second. So this is a national effort that patients can go and register at this website, sign themselves up, uh, choose to share as much or really as little information as you want about your uh, yourself and your cancer and your treatment, um, including sharing um, old biopsy samples that can then be sequenced um, at the DNA level so we can really start to understand patterns in esophageal and stomach cancer so we can really identify like who's benefiting from these therapies, are there people that really we should target specifically. It's really a wonderful project. Um, and then finally, like I said, I'm going to give you uh, Andrea Eidelman's cell phone number, and, and here it is. Uh, I actually don't know if that's anybody's cell phone number, but I think some nonprofit should probably take it because it just kind of works. So thank you again for having me uh, and for taking, you know, 45 minutes of your time. I hope this was helpful. Uh, you'll probably go wash your hands and, and remain socially distanced. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions, and I'm happy to take a few questions now before the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumner. Um, we did receive some questions. The first one is, um, I am newly diagnosed. What is the first step I need to take with my doctor? Yeah, so that's a, that is a great question, and I think one is to understand the clinical stage, so that is related to the scan uh, primarily, and the second is to, like I said, understand as much about the tumor. So when you meet with your care team, um, ask them, you know, what is my stage and what are my biomarkers? Those, those kind of five questions that I tried to highlight in the, in the webinar, um, I think really you can learn a lot. Um, and then if you don't get answers that are satisfactory, you know, don't be satisfied and don't don't accept that. Uh, I would say keep looking. And um, if you need to uh, talk to other people, then that's fine. We encourage multiple opinions. But um, gathering all the information is the most important thing at the beginning. You want to have as complete of a picture of you, uh, so your other medical conditions, thing that might affect treatment choices, as well as your tumor. So that's the molecular information that also will affect your treatment choices. The more information you have at the beginning, the better, the better options you'll have about picking the best therapy. Great. Thank you. Um, another question. Are biomarkers common knowledge to oncologists? The, I mean, yes. We use biomarkers in basically almost every type of cancer. And so in lung cancer, they have probably the most biomarkers available and the most approved drugs. Breast cancer has biomarkers uh, and stomach cancer has fewer than some other cancers, but your any oncologist should be very familiar with the concept of biomarkers. They may be more familiar with diseases that they see more often like colon or prostate or breast cancer. Um, and that's why I think educational webinars like this are particularly important so that both you can understand what are the stomach cancer biomarkers, because who knows, you might be educating your oncologist. Uh, none of us can know everything. If you ask me about breast cancer, I, I, there are probably patients that know more than me about breast cancer. Okay, another question. Do they typically test for clot in protein, or do you have to ask? Yeah, so this is a tricky one. Um, this is not something that's typically tested in any labs. The only way that I'm aware of to get this type of testing currently is, is through participating in one of the clinical trials uh, sponsored by the company that makes uh, Zolbituximab, the antibody against Claudin. So you have to actually 
go to a center that has the trial available, which you could find on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and then sign on to the study and wait to see if your tumor is positive. If it's negative, then you can't go on to the trial. If you're one of the 30% or so that are positive, then the trial may be an option for you. Uh, so unfortunately, um, the real answer to that is, is no currently. All right, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions. Dr. Klumner, thank you again for joining us and sharing your expertise. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you again to Mark Estellas and Bristol Myers for making our webinar series possible this year. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's presentation. We would love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts, so please be sure to take the brief survey that will be sent to you once the webinar concludes. For any questions or suggested topics for future webinars, please send comments to programs at debbiesdream.org. Thank you for tuning in.